We're here giving a TED talk because we run a thrift shop. That is a sentence I never thought I would say. It started when there was this huge chasm between everything that we knew was going on in the world and everything we could actually do about it. Do you remember May of 2020? I remember sitting in my living room amidst piles of immigration papers. It was two months into quarantine. I was listening to the news of police brutally murdering black people in plain sight and suddenly feeling like the reality for people of color in the United States was not far from living under the dictatorship that I was running away from. I was Cloroxing canned goods, and there were people righteously marching in the streets. I had just come from a long stretch of time dealing with chronic illness where all of my energy had to go into my own survival, and my partner's too. He had just finished three years of chemo. The thing is, I now had more energy to give than I had ever had before in my adult life. So while I was scared to leave my house because of the risk of COVID complications, I had to find a way to do something. Julia and I grew up 5,000 miles apart. I was basically brought up with the knowledge that eventually, no matter what, I'd have to leave my country, Belarus, because of the authoritarian regime. But even then, as a kid, I still religiously went to all of these protests in hopes that my tiny presence would help change something. It didn't. I came to the United States alone at 16. Seven years later, in 2020, I was once again seeing people trying to make change, and I wanted to help. Sure, I had no money. That's fine. I could go to a protest. Incorrect. Turns out, if you are an immigrant and you get arrested for civil disobedience, you can get deported. So I started calling my friends to try and figure out what to do. Thankfully, one of those friends was Jillian. I was a dual degree student at that time, studying flute performance and human rights. I was learning so much about the theory and the history behind activist movements and shaping my skills for critique. But that didn't mean I knew what to do in that moment. My schedule was full and my bank account was not, so donating more than $100 really wasn't possible. So we couldn't donate. Neither of us could go to a protest. But clearly we had capacity to do something. We just had to figure out what. Well, we did have something else in common. We did both grow up in secondhand clothes. By middle school, I was using my babysitting and, more importantly, goat-sitting money to buy outfits that I wore for school and for flute recitals and hanging out with my friends. And the clothing that I could find in these funky local thrift shops in my hometown in Vermont always felt like they had all this possibility. I frankly hated conventional shopping my entire life, but I've always known how to thrift because back in Belarus, my mom used to buy clothing for me by the bag. As a kid, I thought it looked obnoxious. As an adult, I think my childhood photos are some of the coolest shit I've ever seen. <laughs> so the connection between grave social injustice and thrifting isn't exactly an obvious one. What we didn't tell you yet is our thrift store is called Thrift to Fight. And in the beginning, it wasn't a store at all. Back in June of 2020, we didn't know how we could fight for what we believed in. And we weren't the only ones. All around us, every day, we heard people say things from two completely opposite ends of the spectrum. I feel helpless. I don't even know where to start. I alone have to do everything to change the entire world today. What a perfect way to get completely stuck, right? And it's understandable that you would feel that way because Especially online, many calls for action went out indiscriminately. Everybody should donate money. Everybody should volunteer here. Everybody needs to go to their town board meeting. And everybody should care about this one cause. And that everyone is you, alone. If you manage to take all prescribed actions, congratulations, you pass a civic engagement. If you don't or you simply can't, you fail. It feels like it's all or nothing. This dynamic, for many, gave way to some performative exclamations and quickly burning initiatives, and eventually just led to this perpetual critique of each other's actions, or worse, an endless stream of self-congratulations, especially within bubbles of young, progressive white people. 
we were all of those things. So we had to be really, really honest with ourselves. And the truth was that we simply didn't have enough experience to be reinventing the wheel of activism with our limited wheel-making knowledge. And the last thing we wanted to do was fall into the long legacy of white saviorism. But we also couldn't allow ourselves to stand still because every day, ding, 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 notifications were popping up from this initiative and that, asking others to Venmo them for medical kits, safe rides, bottled water, printing paper, all the small, boring, but necessary stuff to keep people going. Since we couldn't join them, maybe we could at least support them. But with what? We were literally looking around ourselves, secluded in our apartments for something, anything we could contribute. Oh, clothes. For starters, our closets were full. So we piled up all the dresses and jeans and sweaters onto an old blanket, onto a porch, and we called it a thrift sale. We would donate all the money raised to people who were doing the work that we couldn't do, like a group that was providing safe rides for black trans protesters in New York City. Our friend Anna immediately, right there on the spot in like three seconds, created an Instagram account, and we gave it a name that felt the most true, the most direct, and maybe somewhat inflammatory. Thrift to fight fascism. That's an actual photo from the first sale. <laughs> and within the first hour, all sorts of people heard about our sale from passersby. And instead of just coming to buy clothes, they first went back to their houses and brought their clothing to us. So at the end of a gray, rainy day in a 1,000 person village, we raised 600 bucks and somehow ended up with more clothing than we had started with. $600? That may not seem much, but for grassroots organizers, that money could go really, really far. It's the difference between getting one and a dozen people home safe after a rally. And everyone was asking us, when's the next sale? I was thinking, next sale? I guess we have to do another one. Where else are we gonna put all these clothes that we don't need? And so we did. We organized another sale, and another, and another, and another, until our entire summer was full with collecting, sorting, and selling donated items. But finally, it didn't feel like we were stuck in one place anymore. We were also no longer just raising money. We were spreading information in person. You'd come to a thrift to fight sale for clothes, and you'd also walk away with a book, a zine, and the phone number of someone you needed to connect with. So many people started joining us that I'm pretty sure I made more friends in the summer of 2020 than I had in the decade prior. And it was because during peak COVID rates, pre-vaccine, we were creating opportunities to be together in person while distanced, masked, and outside. We talked about everything that was so confusing about 2020. We laughed and we grieved and we spent time together. Here's why it felt so unique. At that same time, most institutions and foundations were actually shutting down, but we were just getting started. By that point, some people were driving hours just to get to a thrift to fight sale. So we thought, okay, why don't we go to them? So at the end of my senior year, we dreamed up an unthinkable project. We were going to rent a truck, load it with just enough clothing for one sale, and attempt to go on a tour of New York State. All the money raised at one sale would stay there in that community, but the clothing collected there would be sold in the next city the next day. And we did just that with our friends Colin and Gordon. Spanning nine cities in three weekends, we saw hundreds of people coming together over thrifting to raise money for racial, disability, and queer justice. Somebody actually got so inspired by one of those sales that they started their own thrift to fight chapter at Buffalo State University. It's now been running for two years. <laughs> We came back energized and also exhausted, so we took some time to reflect and with attention to both what was working so well with thrift to fight pop-ups. The sense of community, the scrappy come-togetherness. And what was not working. <laughs> the chaos of hauling clothing outside in unpredictable weather, especially winter, perpetually filling our personal spaces with other people's trash bags full of clothes. We let ourselves imagine what thrift to fight could become. What we needed was a space where people could come together all year long. 
And it needed to be a space that could be actually self-sustained. Meaning it wouldn't depend on the two of us volunteering all of our time until we could no longer pay for our own food and housing. So one afternoon, Jillian, Colin, and I were sitting on that very same porch that hosted our first sale. And I remember saying, let's open a store, maybe? That's bold. We could try. <laughs> but to go from sporadic pop-up sales to actually opening a storefront, we had to learn a whole entire new set of vocabulary and, most importantly, the skills to go along with it. So after a year of shaping our work around raising and donating funds for other initiatives while being 100% grounded in our values, we were now in these new territories with entrepreneurs and business coaches and angel investors. <laughs> that world was alien. And true, sometimes talking to business bros felt horrible. <laughs> but we were on a quest. We were excited. Thriftified could become a permanent place. However, the further we went into the weeds of capitalism, the more we had to prioritize. The classic things, rapid growth, scalable models, higher returns. We were suddenly convinced that we needed to raise and then repay hundreds of thousands of dollars in investment to even have a sliver of a chance at a successful business. Sound familiar? We were back at that all or nothing crossroads. So we needed to get regrounded in our original goal doing something. <laughs> that business model turned out to be pretty difficult to explain to an actual billionaire, and we did try. Fortunately, at that same time, we were also meeting people who weren't billionaires and still wanted to share their resources with us. And that funding was just enough to convince a landlord to rent to us. And that was a good start. Now that a store was in the realm of possibility, everybody around us was ready to rally. And because of that, in January of 2022, Thrift to Fight, the store, opened on the bright first floor of a historic building in the same town where we both live. We fixed it up and remodeled it and decorated it with a giant ragtag team. It was us, yes, but also a local painter who runs karaoke at the pub down the street, a bard college dean with an affinity for carpentry, the same one who made these letters. All of these friends and all of these students who were around at that time. And now that we're open, people come in and say things like, Hey, I remember helping you paint this door and those walls at 2 a.m. Didn't we meet in a parking lot so I could give you five garbage bags full of clothes? I can't believe that turned into this. A mom once told us, This is the only place where my trans kid feels comfortable shopping. At Thrift to Fight, we get to see cross-generational sharing. Someone's old sweater from the back of their closet becomes this new beloved item that a first-year college student will build every outfit around. And their very action of getting that sweater from Thrift to Fight is continuing this long chain of thrifters and fighters who got us from 600 to $75,000 raised. <laughs> And all of that money was donated to people who are already doing great work, whether it be to reunite families after prison or help kids coming back from ICE detention centers. Or to keep someone safe and affirmed when their entire existence is being outlawed. So how does this apply to you? Well, if you've ever read the news and then had no idea what to do with that information, we can relate. Because... Every step of the way with Thrift to Fight, we've been meeting people who are also tired, disillusioned, angry, busy, and most of the time, overwhelmed. And we watch those people find the space between the delusion of helplessness and the delusion that they alone have to do it all. You can find that space too. What do you have? Start by taking stock of anything that is accessible to you. It can be something as simple as secondhand clothes or literally anything else. And maybe it's knowledge, especially if your insight comes from your direct experiences with unjust systems that you have had to fight. If you're feeling a little pang of scarcity right now, that's normal. And it will start to dissipate when you remind yourself that there are now more than 8 billion people on Earth 
So when you go from the individual to the collective like that, you're no longer stuck in this all or nothing mindset because we can each just do our own part. Like us and the protesters, we so desperately wanted to join. We couldn't do what they were doing, but we could give them something that they needed. During three years of building a movement by telling people they can thrift to fight, among other things, we've come to the conclusion that the real abundance all along was actually not even clothes. It was people's hunger to be part of something. So if you want to make a difference, find a way that works for you, however unconventional it may be. And the next time you sort through your closet, let it remind you that together, we have more than enough to put up a good fight. Thank you. Thank you.